Uh, today we've got Anthony Towns, current uh, Debian project leader, creator of the testing distribution of Debian. Uh, he was to talk about um, the testing distribution. Okay. Woo. Okay, so that's obviously who I am. Um, I guess all of you are familiar with what Debian is. I'm sorry, I um, like to do these talks by actually getting audience participation to like asking questions and getting you to stick up your hands. And as I understand it, you're really into unit tests and stuff here. So if we could just run a unit test to see if you can stick up your hands now. Okay, we've got one failure over there, but that's okay, I guess. And as an optimization thing, can we just see if we can do that as well? Because it's probably easier than doing all this stuff. Okay, optimization obviously isn't very good here. Okay, so Deb Debian's a volunteer Linux distribution. That's in a sense all it is. So we don't have we don't have major overarching goals like support the most distributions like NetBSD might or be the, as secure as possible like OpenBSD might or get lots of market share or get get Microsoft off the standard install like Ubuntu does or any of those things. We're just get a Linux distribution out and whatever anyone else wants to do is is just whatever they bring to the project, that's fine, they can add it in, but nobody else will necessarily work on it. So that means that things like releasing and stuff depends on people who actually want to do the work. So you've got to have, your release managers might be focusing on getting the bugs fixed and getting stuff done, while other people might be just happy plugging away at the latest um, numeric release or something like that and not really care if it gets released officially and just keep using unstable and so forth. Okay, does everyone know what Debian stable and unstable is? Yes, yeah, stick your hand up if you know. Woo! Excellent. Okay, so what, who did, does anyone, did anyone here use Debian before 98? Cool. So Way back then, we only had stable and unstable, and to do a new stable release would freeze unstable. Nobody would upload to unstable. They'd all upload to frozen unstable. So you wouldn't get any new development till the freeze ended. And the freeze would then go on for years because there were bugs and whatever else. And we kind of found that, or at least the kind of conceptual email was one of BDAL's quite a while ago, which took stable stable uses is kind of wanting something that kind of just sticks there and will work and that they don't have to worry about too much. While unstable people wanted all the new software and could cope with whatever crap bugs like init not working or bash not working or dpackage not working or not having apt in the first place back then, I guess. But there were also kind of a whole lot of people, presumably like everyone who uses Ubuntu, who wants new software but doesn't want it to break all the time either. And so that's kind of the third group that Debian wasn't addressing at all at the time. Okay. So, ah, cool. So, for 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 stable, um, Debian can sort of say, well, look, it's meant to be stable, so it doesn't matter if we delay the release a little bit more, as long as we just keep getting stuff right. People might complain a bit, but. I mean, the overall goal for stable is obviously just make it work, make it upgrade cleanly, make the packages work, have it be supportable. And if it's delayed, well, we're a volunteer group. People are used to Debian being delayed, whatever. And for the unstable side, it's completely opposite. You can say, as long as we get the packages in, doesn't matter if they're a bit buggy, like all the Debian unstable users are lead hackers, so they can fix the problems themselves. They're expected to fix the problems themselves, and they know that there are going to be problems. So. This isn't a surprise for anyone. So you just want to get the stuff in as soon as possible. And once it's actually in there, you update it again when there are bugs fixed. So that kind of works too. But for a kind of middle ground, you have a problem where if you update it too often, you start getting too many bugs. And that annoys people. And if you don't update it often enough, you're stuck with really old software. And people start complaining about that, even if it's basically just a month old or something. So where you can kind of um, let things slide in one direction for stable releases and let things slide in the other direction for unstable releases a bit, you can't really do, there's no simple middle ground for that for testing either. Okay. 
Now, I've got some numbers in here, and I'm talking to Google. I'm not sure that they're all that impressive because they're in like the thousands and hundreds of thousands rather than millions and billions, but we'll go with them anyway. So Debian has lots of packages, and they basically just keep increasing and so forth, and we try to support all of them essentially equally because, yep. One number is missing up there. How many developers are there? Uh, volunteers. So how many developers is kind of an odd question or a difficult question to answer properly. We've got about 1,000 official developers at the moment, but for the last, what, three, four, maybe five years, we've had sponsorship, which means that people who aren't developers are still maintaining packages and doing a lot of the work, so it's not exactly clear how you count those. Um, 1,000 is one guess saying that like a bunch of the developers don't actually do any work at the moment, so just assume that the two numbers balance out and a thousand's right. I've seen 1,500 guessed as well, but... Um, yeah, a thousand's been the nominal figure for quite a while now, so a thousand. Um, yeah, our last estimate for users was something like 50 million, if you count all the distributors, all the derivatives and stuff as well, but... Yeah, no idea is really the best answer. Um, so actually dealing with all these packages, I mean, there's quite a bit of, of, of um, I don't know, there are quite a lot of nodes in the graph and quite a lot of connections between them, and it gets kind of complicated. Uh, how does that show up? OK, so way back when, in about 2000, when we started implementing testing, uh, we were getting 500 meg, maybe a gigabyte of changes a day. At the moment, we're, well, back here before the last three months, we were averaging about two gig. As the release gets closer, we're kind of leaning towards four gig of changes a day, which is also kind of unpleasant when you've got to push that through to people and, and whatever else. Um, so can you see the labels on that OK from the back? So each of the different colors are different um, architectures that have uploaded packages that day. So at the bottom, you've got the blue graph, which is the source megabytes per day. Above that, you've got the architecture all packages, so the ones that just get installed on any architecture, no binaries or anything like that. And alphabetically, each of the architectures Debian supports in unstable above that. So on the days when there's a lot of source uploads, then all the auto builders will give you a lot of um, binary uploads that day too. And yeah, as you have, I think, weekends, you can tend to see a little bit of a spike on. And as the release gets serious, you can kind of see a bit of a trend on too. OK. And the other problem with this is that when you actually do, when you actually do update, um, for testing, people actually run it. So they'll go up, get upgrade and not be the elite hackers who use unstable, but be someone who's actually going to have a problem if stuff breaks. Likewise, you have all the mirrors so that if you update a bunch of stuff in testing and thus lose all the old versions, the mirrors are going to delete that from their, from their disk, which means that if you then wanted to revert something, that's not going to work because you're then going to have to pulse it all out again. So you've kind of got a lot of constraints there because this is all, so users are just trying to use it. They're not volunteering their time to test it so much. They just want to have a working system. So breaking it for them is kind of rude. Having the mirrors get screwed either by having, well, mostly by having lots of bandwidth sent in a day is also kind of rude because we already do four gigs a day, which at least, OK, maybe not in Silicon Valley, but in other places is quite a lot of, quite a lot of transfer. We've got about 200 gigs on the archive, and having it increase too much is also bad, which is a problem if unstable and testing start diverging. So if you have the same version of a package in unstable and testing, that's fine, because you've only got one copy on the disk, but if you have uh, 20,000 odd packages or 200,000 packages with different versions in four architectures, in four suites, sorry. So Woody, Sarge, Etch, and Sid, and possibly Experimental as well. 
then that's an extra an extra copy as well that you don't really have space for on many mirrors. Um, and the other constraint is that um, when you do an apt get upgrade, it'll tend not to be willing to downgrade for you. So if you release a buggy package and say, oh crap, I should have, I would have really better with the old version. If you just put the old version back on the mirrors, that won't actually get upgraded. It'll just sit there on the mirror. New installs will get the old version, but people who already upgraded will say, no, I've got a newer version. I'm not upgrading to that. So and just sit there and be broken. So you've got a fairly complicated bunch of stuff. You've got a lot of people who will complain if you get it wrong, and you don't really have much chance of fixing it if you get it wrong. OK. And the other thing I see downstairs was one of the original Google racks or something. So four CPUs or something per level and a dozen of them or so. And yeah, that's probably if you did that today with whatever the current current model gigahertz machines are, that would that rack would contain more processing power than Debian.org has. So we don't actually have that many machines. So the the FTP master, which runs the testing scripts, hosts the archive, also hosts the wiki, also hosts the um, bug database, and is admin by about three people. So we don't really, we can't really say that, ah, oh, well, if something goes wrong, then someone will just wake up and get a page and fix it. And if, if it gets kind of the wrong answer, well, there'll be someone awake the next morning to review it and whatever else. You have to get it, you have to get all those constraints satisfied essentially automatically every day. Because again, if testing doesn't get updated on the, on the every day, people say, ah, oh, well, I wanted that package. It was meant to get through today. Why didn't it get through? And again, you have, the, you have the not being updated enough to get the new bugs fixed and whatever else. OK. OK, so if you're going to automatically do release management, the question is, what are you going to be able to look at automatically? Because you can't just do an install, get a feel for it. Oh, yeah, that's pretty much as, as smooth as I'd hoped it to be. I mean, there's some bugs, but yeah, they're within the expected sort of tolerance, which you could do if you were doing the release management, management with an actual person. So the way that the testing stuff works is it looks at the criteria that it can automatically test. So one of the things that you can automatically test is the consistency of the distribution by looking at the dependencies and conflicts and seeing if the packages can actually be installed together. So it's no good having an updated version of a library if one of the applications that depend on, depends on it hasn't also been updated to the new version of the library. And likewise, if you update a library that suddenly, or if you update one application that starts conflicting with another one because it's changed its API, then that other application needs to be updated too so that you can still use them all together and have a consistent system. Um, that doesn't actually cover everything, though, because there are some sorts of things that users expect. So you expect to be able to install all the KDE packages or all the GNOME packages at once. But sometimes some of them will depend on one set of libraries. Others will depend on another set of libraries that will conflict. And while you can install that one program fine and this one program fine, you can't actually install them both together at the same time. And you'll see a few things. Well, I'm not sure if you've seen if you'll see that these days break, but at least in the past few years you will see it break because it can't be checked automatically easily. Okay. So we have all these elite hackers using unstable who then go ahead and file bugs and file patches and stuff. And we've got a bug tracking system that will track all those bugs and actually make them and you can query that and see, well, which of these new versions actually have introduced new bugs. So we can track that automatically fairly easily too. And we can also check whether all the build de daemons, which create those pretty graphs, have actually successfully built the source packages. And if they haven't, there's probably a bug like a, a, net, uh, uh, sorry, a, a byte order sort of, um, sorry, there's probably a platform specific bug that will only show up on some platforms, which will often actually be wrong on other ones, but just not show a compile time error. 
which basically gives you another set of automated bug, te bug testing. And I mean, for packages that have test suites, that'll also be covered. Um, and all those logs are available automatically and will come up as to whether the package is up, is up to date on each, each architecture and unstable. OK. So those are basically the three key things that you can check automatically. I'm going to skip ahead for a bit. Uh, that one. OK, so what, what the automated testing stuff will actually, will actually produce is a list of excuses why packages can't be considered. So GNU Cache uh, yesterday um, is two days old. So it's been uploaded a couple of days ago, but was obviously high urgency, so is able to get in fairly quickly because it fixes some really critical bugs. Um, it didn't build successfully on M68K, but we're not caring about M68K, so the testing scripts are willing to ignore that. And we've also found that GNU Cache has introduced a new bugs since the last version that got, got accepted in testing, and that bug's still present. So, OK, did everyone understand that explanation then? Yep. Can you tell me what you didn't understand? No, I did understand it. Oh, you did understand it. Yeah. Excellent. One person understood it. That's not so excellent. Is that one greater than zero and automatically counted bug number? You OK, so. It has more bugs than it had before? The zero is the number of bugs in the version in testing, or the number of release critical bugs. There are probably some other bugs, but not ones that we're bothered caring about that much. Um, the one is the number of bugs currently in the bug tracking system against unstable. So if it had three bugs, but the version in testing had four, it would have said three less than or equal to four and said not worrying about the bugs because it's better off this way. Um, we introduced version tracking in the bug, in the bug tracking system uh, last year, which in theory should allow us to do those numbers a little bit more accurately. At the moment, they're approximated somewhat. Um, so for example, that new bug that's been found since the last version got into testing could actually apply to the version in testing as well. Um, these scripts don't check that yet because they don't have the appropriate support for it. OK, so that gives you an idea of the first round of checks that it can do before it's checked actual dependencies. OK, for actually checking dependencies, that gets to be a bit of a harder problem. So you have lots of packages, but each one of those has multiple dependencies, and some of them are alternate, alternate dependencies, and, many, and there are also conflicts thrown in as well. Um, and essentially, we want every package in testing to be installable at once. So you don't just have to test those million-odd equations but you have to test it for each particular package being able to be set to be installable as well. So you've got a million equations in 200,000 variables, and you want, to find a, you want to make sure that there's a solution where every single one of those variables is set, is set to true independently. So you first want to check that dpackage is installable, then you want to check that GNOME is installable, then you want to check that um, FEWM is installable, and check that you can satisfy each of those dependencies and conflicts all at once while having one of these packages packages set to be installed. Um, so when I was writing these slides, I tried to do the proof for the, for the proper NDP completeness, but uh, yeah, got confused and it didn't fit on a slide, so whatever. Um, So um, everyone here knows what NP completeness is, right? Uh, who thinks it stands for non-polynomial? Excellent. OK. So you have essentially an NP complete problem that you need to check for every package every single time you try and add a package. So if you've got 100-odd updates to see if you can put into testing each day, 
you need to check each of those million dependencies for each of those 100,000 packages for each one of those 100, 100 packages you're going to update. And technically, you ought to be doing it for every two to the 100 combinations of those packages that you could be putting in. So for the NP complete thing, you need a backtracking algorithm or else it's not going to be correct. You don't really want to approximate because, um, well, you've got a bunch of people hacking. And funnily enough, they actually turn up some of the edge cases for the sorts of algorithms you come up with. When I was originally trying to write the algorithm and see if I could get it correct, I would come up with odd cases where, no, clearly this package is installable. I'd go act get and I'd say, no, I won't install it for you. And I'd go, no, that seems fine, and that seems fine, and that seems fine. And you could go down four or five levels and come up with something that's just not quite right because someone edited the dependence line by hand and got it slightly wrong. So you do actually have the depends on this or this, and this or this depends on that, and that depends on this, which conflicts with this, and this other thing depend depends on that. And because they conflict, you can't actually install this thing here. But you can install every other thing that any of them depends on. OK. So you can't approximate because you just don't want to have people get the result that, no, oh, I can't install this. That's the entire point of this. You want to be able to sit at your computer and go out, get install, whatever, and have it work. And have it come up with a package that's not terribly broken, that is the same across all architectures, so that you're running the same system on Spark or AMD64 or i386 or M68K or whatever. OK. Um, the normal case, uh, obviously, for an NP complete problem, you don't want to just do exponential stuff all the time. So you want to find the normal case and have that be fairly quick. So the normal case is that generally things aren't broken. So in 100,000 packages, you've got 800 release critical bugs at the moment. The vast majority work fine. Um, generally, while you do have options in, in dependencies, generally either option will work. So you can just choose the first one or the highest priority one. And generally, conflicts don't actually matter. They usually refer to old versions of programs that you're not actually using at the moment. And yeah. OK. So the algorithm we use um, basically tries iterating through iterating. Th um, is there any sort of thing I can point with? OK, I guess a hand. Uh, what's that? Excuse me. Excellent. Now I wonder if I can go. Um, OK, so this is for Gosa, which is some random package that had a problem on September the 16th or something. And it couldn't work, testing couldn't work out whether it was, um, whether it was installable over about 100 million iterations or something, because there were too many alternatives and it had to backtrack too much and whatever else. So these back here are the first level dependencies of Gosa. So those are the things it depends on directly. And the next lot of things, so these, are the ones that something it depends on depends on directly and there's no alternatives. So there's no point backtracking if they're not installed, right? So if smart, smarty get text doesn't exist, you know you're not going to be install, able to install Gosa, so you just stop. If smarty get text depends on libc6, then if libc6 does, isn't installable, you're not going to be able to install Gosa either. So you know you can just stop there. So we basically expand a tree backwards in a list along here until we get to something with an alternative. So whatever package it is that depends on PHP 5 could also be satisfied by a different package. So PHP 5, www, or PHP 6, or PHP 4, or something else. Yep. Would you want to have, would you want to guarantee that both alternatives are installable in case somebody had picked one or the other? Um, 
that would be nice, but it's not always the case. So if you've, if you've picked one package that requires you to use XM, so you've got some XM um, uh, log analysis tools that are obviously going to specifically depend on XM, and you have another package that will work with any MTA, and then you've got something else that depends on both, then while the MTA package could be satisfied by anything, in this case it won't because you'll need to have XM installed for the other thing it depends on. Um, ideally, you would like to be able to do that, and in theory, Debian has a policy that any optional package, or rather all the optional packages, can all be installed together. It's been a while since we've actually made that true, though. Okay. So, um, the PHP 5 thing will have some alternatives and uh, will probably depend on some of these PHP 5 packages here, maybe. So, you need to delay those, those, bleh, those alternatives past all the other stuff. You can't just say, well, if I'm depending on PHP 5, then I'm obviously going to depend on all the stuff PHP 5 depends on, because you don't actually know you depend on PHP 5. Oops. So the trick we use there is basically um, to have a cutoff as well as all the actual dependencies in the list, so that if I've decided I'm going to backtrack here, then my cutoff is going to tell me where all the dependencies I've had for this package are. So if I'm going to switch from looking at PHP 5 to looking at PHP 4 as my solution to the dependency, then I can cut off all the dependencies after that cutoff and add PHP 4s in there from there. And I know at this point that once I move on uh, past PHP 5 to libc 6.1 and whatever else I've got to look at, um, I'll only need to add their dependencies after the cutoff. So that wasn't the best explanation, but um, so the idea is that you're putting the ones that you know you need to consider first in the list, so you can skip over them as quickly as possible. And you're delaying the ones with alternatives till the end, so that they're the ones that you'll have to retry if you get into conflicts. So if you definitely fail early, that's good, because you then know you failed. You definitely can't do anything if libc6 doesn't install. And you don't need to worry about the, about the multiple options, which is where you get into the exponential sort of cases. And sorry, yep. OK. Um, but when you do get to the options, you have a very easy way of backtracking, because you can just cut off all the crap that you've added to it afterwards and just step back through the list for each thing. OK. Isn't this huge dependency tree also a clue that somebody should have broken up the package into smaller pieces if they, if they could? Breaking up the packages into small, into small pieces is what tends to get the huge dependency trees, though. Because then you have one large package like GNOME that depends on all the things that make up all the different sorts of packages yeah, that make up GNOME. Yeah, but GNOME's a pseudo package, right? There's no yes. tree to the GNOME is a pseudo package that then depends on all the specific packages that GNOME uses. Some of them in alternatives because you want to be able to use Firefox or Epiphany or Evolution or Thunderbird. Yeah. And it's those alternatives that then start getting you the complicated cases. And each of those packages have to be installable for the GNOME pseudo package to be installable, which then gives you all their libraries that you have to worry about which tend to include sound packages, which have alternatives for ULSA and OSD, um, OSD? OSS. OSS. Yes. And often one of those will fail, or maybe both of them will fail, and then you've got GStreamer and all sorts of other things. And yes, GNOME regularly gets into the, into the exponential cases. So. Any other questions on that? Oh, Christ. OK, so first version of the algorithm to do that was written entirely in Perl, because Perl's kind of easy to write with, and I didn't know Python at the time. But it was horribly slow. Like, it would take 10 minutes just to see if one package was installable, as opposed to all 100,000, and then do it again and again and again. 
So rewritten in C relatively quickly, quickly. And obviously then I wanted to be able to call the C from the Perl that I'd written. Um, that's Perl XS. Can anyone understand it? Has anyone written Perl XS before? Is it horrible? Um, that's the Python version. Sorry? There is yeah, there there is. I think this was before Sweep was really popular when I was writing this. And then I didn't want to touch it again. And then I found Python had an actual sane C syntax. So, so yeah. So there's my yay Python thing for all the Googlers, whatever. Uh, OK. So one of the things that we actually come up with as still a problem is transition. So if you update Postgres from version 7 to 8 or 8 to 8.1 or 8.1 to 8.2, you change the library. And you also want to update all the, all the programs that have hooks for PostgreSQL all basically at the same time so that they all keep working together. And that then becomes a problem if one of those random programs that you want to update at the same time is broken for completely unrelated reasons or also needs to be updated because of a QT transition and QT is, up, is broken because of something else. So as well as all that stuff, we also need to be able to say to the testing scripts that, look, these combination of packages are the ones that are most likely to work together and that we need to find more information about. And so the release managers and release team and release assistants have a way of hinting Brittany as to what the most important sort of things to look at. Uh, OK. So for example, the hint command there says that GNU steps in a transition at the moment. And you'll need to update all three of these packages at once and probably a whole bunch of others for the installability to be satisfied. Because if you just update, uh, if you just update GNU step base, that will probably break GNU step GUI and a whole bunch of things that it depends on. If you don't, uh, GNU step back to, whoops, I didn't format that very well. And likewise, if you update GNU step back without updating GNU step base, it's not going to work because its dependencies aren't satisfied, so it, won't, it will be uninstallable too. OK. Um, the other ones aren't really that exciting. The force hints are just to say that, OK, so it's got bugs. We still want it to go in straight away. Force hint is just to say that, OK, we don't care if it breaks other stuff either. This is too important, and we want it to go in, and we've already checked, and the breakage isn't too severe. So it's through the hints that the human kind of part of release management comes in. Um, so the hints are basically updated in a text file whenever the release managers feel like it. Um, while Brittany runs straight after, straight after the mirror pulse every day, and if it doesn't get hints, it'll just do the easy stuff, basically. Um, the other ones are urgent, which lets it go in sooner. Unblock, which gets rid of the freeze requirements for a package. And that's about it. Yes? About how many hints are there? Is it easy for the humans to figure out where they need to supply it? Sorry? How many hints? About how many hints are required to keep the system running on a day-to-day -day basis? And the other question is, on a on a day to day basis, um, hints aren't required. It's just when there are transitions that come in. There's probably a couple of transitions a week, but it tends to take a while for the for all the related packages to be in an appropriate state to actually be able to go through. You understand? Yeah. yeah I do. Um, the other question is, when a hint is needed for a transition, is it? Is it hard to figure out what to do, or is it immediately obvious? Oh, yeah, the log jam is this package, and I need to get it here to um, OK, so skipping on, kind of. Um, one of the things that the excuses page also has, which I didn't show there, was it also tells you when one package um, can only be updated when another package is updated as well. It's got a version dependency on the new one that requires the new one before it'll be satisfied with the old one. Um, and this separate site basically um, counts the number of packages waiting on some other package and will give you the top top 10 list sort of thing. So you can see that 
a bunch of packages are waiting on GNU Step Base, GNU Step GUI, and GNU Step Back at the moment. And since they're all GNU Step ones, they're probably all related. When you give it, when you give the testing scripts a hint, it will try it, try all the other packages that can also be included at the same time after those dependencies are satisfied. And then give you a list of which ones failed. So when you see the ones that failed, you then need to look back and see, oh, they failed because no one's even bothered updating them, or they've been updated, but only a couple of days ago, so they haven't actually, they've still been excused and not considered, or they've got really critical bugs, or they're linked in with some other transition, or whatever other reason. So um, there's a kind of straightforward process for it. I wouldn't call it easy, per se. Like the bootstrapping problem, when you want to bootstrap an architecture, you have to build certain packages that don't spin up other packages. I mean, it's sort of a way of getting it around is, that, but in an incremental form. Um, it is a bootstrapping sort of thing, oh, yes. Yeah. Um, in theory, it wouldn't be needed if Brittany could be bothered actually trying all the two to hundred, two to hundred combinations of the hundred packages that are going to be considered, but that just takes too long. Um, it's different for new architectures because when you've just got a new architecture, you need to get all the essential packages in and, and so forth too, so it's much easier just to say, we're going to completely ignore the dependencies for the time being and just try and get the packages in sync and let users actually figure out at what point it's kind of consistent enough to start really enforcing things. And that's what we did with AMD64 earlier this year and the other new architectures way back when. Okay. So when when the testing scripts try try to add the C C++ reference source package and all its binaries to testing, it'll give you this sort of output, which is to say that um, so first of all we know that it accepted the package. So this was one of the ones that was good enough. Um, we originally had 73 packages uninstallable in testing with an extra 395 in the in architectures we're not considering, which happens to be M68K right at the end. Um, so these are i386, which is the only one we actually care about the installability of architecture all packages on. And the rest are in alpha order. So um, alpha, AMD64, ARM, HPPA, IA64, MIPS, MIPSL, etc. So as the scripts run, you basically get a running total of how it affects the uninstallability. If, see, if this one had failed, we would have seen maybe it failed on alpha before it failed on anything else. We'd see that go up to six or seven or 100. And then we'd get a list of all the packages that it made uninstallable underneath, which the release managers would then need to see. Oh, OK, well, this is the obvious problem. I'll need to go and talk to these people to get, these people to get it fixed. OK, that's fondly known as updateoutput.txt. It doesn't have a better name. OK. And um, who finds those two pages easy to understand? Um, so yeah, shortly after, well, a little while after testing was actually running and people were using it, um, I got pestered for explanations, which got put up on the website. And once there were explanations up on the website of what all this stuff meant, so you didn't have to actually look through the code to understand it, we started getting um, different sites, like this one's a particularly good one, born beyond.hacks.c slash Debian, which analyze and make the information more palatable. So packages.qa.debian.org will give you a little bit of information about whether your packages are making it into testing. and as will the package tracking system and so forth. And yeah, that's my, that's my little throwaway for Web 2.0, which is the grabbing information from other people on the web and rearranging it yourself and putting it back up and all that sort of stuff. OK. So um, proposed changes for the future for the scripts themselves. Uh, library transitions are currently a problem because we don't keep the old versions of libraries around generally. So if you've got a package that depends on libfoo0, 
when libfoo1 comes along, that'll be broken because we don't want to distribute libfoo0 anymore and we don't want to go to the effort of maintaining it. Um, but that makes the transitions awkward because all the libfoo packages have to be updated at once. So fairly shortly now, I believe, as part of the Summer of, Co one, the summer of Code student that worked on this, we'll, be, um, we'll have it so that the testing scripts automatically keep around the old library version, um, even though the source no longer builds it, which should make a bunch of those transitions easier. Um, likewise, the better dependency analysis, basically being able to come up with hints more automatically rather as we know what the process is for a hint, want to write it down in code. Once it's written down in code, you don't need manual intervention. And you can just do it every day. Um, and the other thing we're probably going to work on is making it so that you don't have to just let the script run a day, look at the result, run once a day, look at the results it got, change the hints, and then let it run the next day, but rather be able to interact with it directly to say, I think this combination of packages kind of makes sense to try what happens when you do try it? Oh, OK, what happens if you add this package in as well? Oh, OK, then this is the hint that I want to add for the next actual run. OK. All right, so that's the testing scripts. Does anyone want to ask any more questions about that before I go on to a slightly broader topic that we get finished? OK. So stepping back from the scripts is the kind of question of what, what we might want to actually do with releases more generally. So um, one sort of thing that we might want to do is extend the Debian installer beta releases to having the entire testing suite be a beta release every now and then. And I mean, if we do that and we do security support for it, then that's kind of a short-term support release in the opposite sense of Ubuntu's long-term support releases that we might be able to do six monthly or three monthly or whatever just by snapshotting testing and putting it up on a site where it stays for three or six months. Um, so another thing that people often want to do is partial upgrades of particular bits of software, like you want a new version of X or a new version of GNOME but you really just want everything else to stay the same because you don't care about it that much. You just want it to work. Um, Gen 2 has some interesting ways of dealing with that by allowing you to snapshot um, particular areas of code that people will maintain at a particular version. Like you can point your Gen 2 distribution at the latest version of everything except an old version of, of GNOME because the old version was what you wanted and they removed all the options you liked in the new version. Because that, no, that would never happen. Sorry, bad example. Um, and in theory, you ought to be able to do a fairly similar thing in Debian by just saying, use unstable for all of it, except use this, these bits for, from stable. Or you can do it the opposite way as use stable for everything, but grab some of these things from backports. Um, and the, who here used or knows of how Debian AMD64 worked? for Sarge for the last stable release? Yes, no? So we didn't actually release AMD64 as an official part of the last release because we had problems getting space on the mirrors and basically just froze the addition of architectures for way too long. Um, what happened instead was that a bunch of people who wanted to see Debian on AMD64 because they have AMD64 machines like Debian um, is that they set up a separate arch archive called Debian AMD64.debian.net or AMD64.debian.net or whatever, and just pulled the sources from Debian, updated a couple that they needed to, and built them all for AMD64. And that was essentially the Sarge release of AMD64 for Debian. Um, that then got security support added as well via the official, via the official security um, team, which meant that they'd do a security update for everything. So AMD64 and all the regular architectures. And all the regular architectures would then go to the regular archive site, while AMD64 had to go somewhere else. Um, and the question is, and we don't need to do that for AMD64 anymore because it's actually official now. But we're instead dropping M68K, and maybe we'll be introducing some other arch architectures or 
maybe we actually want to do something with herd one of these days. And so another question is whether we want to have some sort of not officially stable, but something similar sort of support for other architectures like M6TAK. OK. You've got any questions or want to raise other topics or anything? Oh my gosh, we're out of time, so we can't talk about Ice Weasel. Um, this was in D64. <clears throat> there was a discussion about adding multi arc support so you can have 32 bit and 64 bit <clears throat> binaries on the same install. Is there some official plan for this? Or? Um, so there's two sorts of multi arch. There's the really easy sort, which is just get the IA32 libs package and then you can basically just how you have the libraries on your system, you can install the i386 programs in opt and run them, and that works for VMware and stuff like that. Um, but the real multi-arch thing that people have wanted for ages, and particularly the IA64 um, people back in the day when IA64 was a going concern, um, wanted to basically be able to just get openoffice.org and all sorts of other packages just straight from the IA386 builds and install them natively. Um, the problem with that is that they then also need the i386 libraries and all the other stuff, which might also exist for the AMD64 stuff. So you've got the i386 GNOME libraries and the AMD64 or i64 GNOME libraries, and you want them all installed at the same time. Um, there's been kind of plans for that for ages, but they're all hideously complicated. Um, the latest I've heard is that um, um, Ubuntu have been, in theory, working on it, but that's with the same people who've been working on it for ages, so I'm not sure it's actually getting, getting much further or not. Um, but that's um, being like a contract with Ubuntu, so in theory it should come up with some result. I don't know how useful it'll be. Um, I personally tend to think the easiest way is just to do the Chirut sort of option and have a full i386 install in a cheroot and just go straight into that. OK, there's no more questions. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.